So let's take a look at the car class first. Um, and, and I like to initialize or to implement the constructors first. Um, they're usually relatively straightforward because for each instance, for in general, sometimes constructors need to do other things. But a good place to start is that for each instance variable, we need to explicitly initialize it to the value that we want based on the documentation we've written. So we have three instance variables, fuel efficiency, fuel and tank, and VIN. And we're going to initialize each of those in our default constructor. So usually when we call methods, we call methods on variables that reference objects. And similarly, to keep things consistent, usually when we reference instance variables, we reference instance variables through variables that reference objects. Um, so we're used to typing the name of a variable and then dot in the name of the method, or in this case, instance variable. But one thing that's potentially confusing here is what variable references the current object? So if I want to set the fuel efficiency, what variable do I use to get to the current object? And in Java, there is a special keyword, a special variable, whose value is always the reference to the current object. And this variable is called this. So I say this dot fuel efficiency equals, uh, what do we say it defaulted to? 30. And when I read that line of code, I read it as this car's fuel efficiency is assigned the value of 30. Okay. Um, so I really like how Java uses the keyword this um, as a special variable whose value is the reference for this object. The object, in this case, that we're in the, we're in the midst of actually constructing, because we're in the middle of making a new car, we're in the constructor. So I'm going to model that we almost always use the this keyword, because I think it makes our code a lot more readable and a lot more clear. Um, there's no confusion about which fuel in the tank we're setting to zero. We're setting this car's fuel in the tank to zero. So we'll initialize the fuel and tank to zero. We'll initialize the VIN uh, string reference to null. Um, but let's comment on this a little bit, because this is really important. So slash star equals, so we get a little comment block. The this reserved word references the current object, like self in Python. Okay. And usually I, like, usually I like Python's choice of language um, better than Java. I think it's more readable. But in this case, I think Java's got the upper hand. I like reading the code. This car's fuel efficiency equals zero. Self seems like a little more awkward because of the perspective of it. But that's all right. Um, so here's the, the thing. Its usage is encouraged, but only sometimes required. Okay. And, and the details of when it is and isn't required we'll get into more later. Here's my recommendation. Just always use this, okay? Next semester, we'll end up with one small case where it's not appropriate to do so. That's a long way away. Get in the habit of always using the this um, to refer to your methods and instance variables. I'm going to model that all year, um, and so I encourage you to do so. It avoids a whole slew of bugs that you can end up writing unintentionally. So. Cool, so we implemented one constructor. Um, let's implement the other constructor. This is going to be very similar um, in that uh, we need to initialize the three instance variables. So fuel efficiency, we're going to set not to 30, but we're going to set to the value that was passed and is now stored in the parameter initial fuel efficiency. Cool. That's exactly what we want. Um, fuel and tank is still going to be assigned to 0. And the VIN is still going to be assigned to null. That part doesn't change. So we have a couple of constructors are now implemented, which is great. So let's, let's choose a method to implement. 
Um, let's finish get fuel and tank. Right now, get fuel and tank is hard coded to always return zero. We don't want this to be the case. We want to return the value of the instance variable that stores how much fuel is in the tank. So I don't remember what we called that, but I'll scroll up here. Ah, it's called fuel in tank. So I'll say return this dot fuel in tank. Because we want to return this, the value of this car's fuel in tank instance variable. So that's a pretty easy method to implement. Let's also do the add fuel method while we're here. The add fuel method is documented to add the specified amount of fuel to this car's tank. And it's not replacing it, it's adding it. So we're taking the current amount of fuel and we're adding more to it. There are two ways we could write this. Um, you may, you've, you've probably written or have seen code like this, which is this dot fuel in tank equals this dot fuel in tank plus amount. And that's totally correct. Personally, I think this is a little bit harder to read um, because like our variables on both sides of the equal sign, what this is really saying is get the current value of the fuel and tank instance variable, add amount to that, take the resulting sum and store it back in the variable instance variable fuel and tank. And that's correct and that's fine. Um, in Java, just like in Python, there's another operator we can use, which is the plus equals operator, which I think is not only more concise, but it's easier to read. The plus equals operator means take the current value of the variable and increment it by the value on the right side here. So add amount to fuel and tank and like store that in fuel and tank. Um, and so the, I think the plus equals is a little bit more natural. Um, so I will keep using that because uh, I think it makes our code easier to understand. So, All right, so we implemented a couple methods. Let's compile our code and switch to the BlueJ project window and click on the run tests button again. Hey, we're making progress. We now have two of four tests passing. The, the uh, add fuel test is now passing as well. Okay. Um, let's take a look at this one, the, uh, the test set vin method. So we're not surprised that's not passing because we haven't implemented set vin or get vin yet. So, so let's do that. Um, the get vin method needs to return a reference to the string of this car's vin. So we can just say return this.vin. For the setVin method, I want to show you a potential issue. Um, often we, if we're not careful, it's, it's very natural. Let's say we named our parameter vin instead of uh, what I have it called? New VIN. We named it VIN. Um, and then let's say we're not being very careful of always using this. And so we tend to write code like this, VIN equals VIN. And what we mean by that is the instance variable VIN should be assigned the value of the parameter VIN. Okay? Um, and I know that's what you mean, but the Java compiler does not know that's what you mean. Okay? Um, because we actually can end up in an unfortunate situation where Java allows you to name a parameter or local variable the same as an instance variable. Okay? And that's just ripe for disaster because now we have two different variables with the same name. Um, and what this code would actually do is it would get the value of the parameter VIN and it would store that value in the parameter VIN and it would never change the instance variable VIN. And then we would be super confused because we don't understand why our test keeps failing because our instance variable is never getting initialized. All right. um, we can avoid that in two ways. If we said this.vin like we should, now we're being explicit. We're saying set this car's instance variable vin to the value of the parameter vin. Okay. And so that helps um, for sure. And I strongly recommend that. 
But I also recommend let's just avoid this whole issue by not naming our parameter and local variables the same as our instance variables. Right? So I'm going to put this back to new vin because that avoids. Now there's no confusion. Right? When we read this code, it's clear the parameter is called new vin, the instance variable is called vin. We're not going to have any issues. Let's make a note of this, though, because this is a pitfall um, that students frequently fall into in the context of this unit. And they get really frustrated because they can't figure out why their code isn't working. Things aren't getting set that should be set. Um, and so hopefully this will remind you of like, oh, there's this thing that's going on. Um, and there's a term for this. So let's say, if the parameter was named vin, it would, the term is called shadowing. So it would shadow the instance variable vin. And so what I mean by this is local and parameter variables shadow instance variables of the same name. So if there's a parameter variable named vin and an instance variable named vin, the parameter variable quote unquote wins. Okay, it hides the other one. So in this code, vin would refer to the par uh, parameter variable and not the instance variable. So that wouldn't work. So two tips. First tip, first suggestion, to refer explicitly, explicitly to an instance variable, use this. But here's my advice. Like that, this is true, and you should know that. But here's my advice. Let's avoid the entire issue. Okay. So avoid this issue by giving local parameter and instance instance variables unique names. Okay? Just it makes your code clearer. There's no need to name a parameter or a local variable the same as an instance variable. It's just going to lead to bugs and confusion. So that's why I named this variable new vin when we typed it here. And actually that's why if you look back up at the constructor we wrote, I named it initial fuel efficiency and not fuel efficiency. Because um, I'm avoiding the same issue in the constructor as we're avoiding here. So keep your names unique. You will Then you won't ever have to worry about falling into this trap. So we wrote another two methods. So let's run our code. Switch back to your BlueJ project window. Run the tests. Let's see if we're making progress. We are. Three of our four tests now pass. The only one that doesn't pass is the test drive method. Which again isn't surprising because we haven't implemented the drive method yet. Right. So let's do that. I think that's our last method to implement. It is. All right. Um, in Java, like programming languages in, in general, it's totally acceptable to do several different operations all on the same line of code. Um, in this class, especially at this point in the semester, I'm going to only do one thing, if possible, per line of code, because I think that makes it easier for all of us to understand what each line of code does, and it makes it easier for us to debug our code, um, because we can see each intermediate step and the resulting value of each step. Um, if you like to do multiple things all in the same line of code, I'm totally OK with that. I'm just not going to um, model that behavior at this point. So. Um, so that's why in doing the drive thing here, I'm going to break this into two steps. I'm first going to calculate how much fuel did we consume by driving the specified distance. Then I'll subtract that from the fuel stored in the tank. So I'm going to create a local variable of type double called fuel consumed. And I'm going to do this calculation first. 
So this dot fuel efficiency divided by distance. So let's calculate how much fuel was consumed and then subtract it from the fuel in the tank. So this dot fuel in tank. Here I'm going to use the minus equal operator and specify fuel consumed. This is very similar to the plus equals. It means take the value of the variable of the expression on the right, in this case fuel consumed, subtract it from the value of the variable fuel in tank, and then store that result in fuel in tank. So again, I think that's just easier to read than um, using the assignment operator and the, and the subtraction separately. So. I think we might be done. So let's switch to the BlueJ project window. And let's run our tests again. And we're not done. <laughs> all right. They do not all pass. Let's see why. Um, let's click on the test drive test. And it says expected 9.5, but was 8.0. We lost a gallon and a half of gas. So I'm going to click on the show source button so I can actually see specifically which assertion failed. All right, it's right here. So we're off for some reason. I'm not sure why. But here's where we have several different options. Okay? Um, if you have previous programming experience, you've probably used these different techniques. One debugging technique, and this is, again, this is part of our, our development process. So this is part of the idea that when we're in this develop mode, we're designing, we're coding, we're testing, and we're debugging. And we need to use like our computational thinking skills as we debug so that we do it in a deliberate and an efficient manner. Some of you may have approached debugging from the perspective of, I'm not sure what's wrong, but I'm going to change something and just run it again, and hopefully it gets better. Okay? And sometimes that works, um, but it can be horribly inefficient. Another technique that you may have used in previous classes is to use print statements. Right? So we could do a bunch of system out print lines, and we could print the values of all the variables we care about. OK, well, how much fuel is there? How much have we driven? And then we could run the program and read through the output and try to infer where our bug is. And that's, there's a time and a place for that. And that's our, primarily, that's our primary method of debugging and programming one and two. Um, but we have better tools with BlueJ than that. What we have is a tool called a debugger. This isn't specific to BlueJ. This isn't specific to Java. Any reasonable integrated development environment is going to have a debugger for us to use. And so a debugger allows us to actually pause the code as it runs and watch what happens step by step and inspect the values of everything at that point in the program. It is crazy super powerful and can make us incredibly efficient. Um, I can't encourage you enough to when things don't work and you're not sure why to use a debugger to help you solve that problem efficiently. We simply don't have time in this class to do like a bunch of print statements and run our code over and over again trying to infer what goes on, um, especially not when we have a tool like this. The way we use a debugger is we set what's called a breakpoint. A breakpoint is a line of code where when the program's execution gets to that line of code, before it runs that line of code, it pauses. Okay? It, it breaks. We don't mean break in like a bad way. We mean break as in like pause. Um, and the way we set a breakpoint is the code has to be compiled. So I'm going to make sure the car test code is compiled. And then you click on the very far left of the line of code you want. So I'm going to want to set a breakpoint for where we're constructing this new car. And on the very far left, I have line numbers turned on. You may not. You may just have dashes. But if I click in this little narrow gutter on the far left of the screen, it's going to make a little red dot. And that's how we set a breakpoint. Okay. So when you click on that, you're going to get a nice red highlight, and you're going to get a little stop sign on that line of code. Anyone not have that? I want to make sure like, we can step through the debugger together. Because I'll come help you 
click the right place. Or check your neighbor. Make sure they have a little red stop sign, too. All right. Well, let's just run our test again and see what happens. Close my test results. Come back here and hit run test. And a new window pops up. If you're on window, well, regardless. So what I like to do is I like to put my code on half my screen and this new window, which is the debugger window, on the other half of the screen. Um, on Windows, the debugger window is such that you can't actually see these buttons at the bottom by default. So there's a little bug in BlueJ about that. But if you click and drag your window to the left side or the right side, it will resize itself so you can see the whole thing. Okay. So I recommend put your debugger on one side, put your code on the other side so you can see both side by side. Let me talk through a little bit about the debugger window here. So. These buttons at the bottom represent the different operations we can perform. Okay, we're going to focus on basically the four on the right right now. Step, there's two types of steps. There's step and there's step into. Step means execute the current line of code and go to the next line of code. Okay? Step into means if the current line of code calls a method or a constructor, step into that method or constructor so we can see what it does. Okay. Continue means start running the code again until we hit another breakpoint or until the program finishes. And terminate means just stop the program right now. We're done. Okay. Um, we'll talk about the rest of this window in a moment. So right now, the current line of code we're on is the line of code where we set the breakpoint. It's highlighted in green to show us it's the line of code that is about to execute. Um, and so we can click the step into button because we're creating a new car. Let's see how that's actually done. So when we click step into, all of a sudden we jump to the car class and we're inside of the constructor um, for the car class, the constructor that takes the single parameter, which is the initial fuel efficiency. And now there's a lot more interesting stuff in our debugger window. The bottom right pane is all of the local variables and their values. Right now, we only have one. It's the parameter initial fuel efficiency. It has a value of 50. The upper pane has all of the instance variables for the current object. Okay, This is all of the this. Fuel efficiency, fuel and tank, and VIN have all been initialized to their default values. In the left pane is what is called the call sequence. This is all the methods that have been called, and the method we're currently in is on the top, and the method that called that method is below it, and the method that called that method is below this. There's a ton of methods here that are all just part of the JUnit framework. We don't really care about any of these. Um, but we can click back on test drive if we want, and we can get to see like, oh, where did we come from? Oh, that's right. We're about to create a new car object. Cool. This one says car.init. Init is what means by, it means the constructor. We're initializing a new car object. We're in the constructor. So let's press the uh, step button. And now we're about to execute the line of code, which will take the value of fuel efficiency and store it in um, the instance variable fuel efficiency. So when we hit step again, we can now see that the instance variable fuel efficiency has been set to 50. Awesome. Let's keep stepping. We're not going to actually, the, the fuel and tank is already zero. VIN is already null. If we hit step again, we're going to return to the test drive method. Now we're still on that same line of code because we made a new car object, but we haven't yet assigned that reference to test car. So we have to hit step one more time. And now you'll see that we have a local variable test car, and its value is object reference. If we double click on test car, it brings up this nice little red window, which shows us the values of all the instance variables of this object we just made. The debugger actually mirrors our physical model we did in the last unit exactly. Okay? So this little local variable part down here is analogous to our post-it note. It just doesn't show us the specific reference. 
this red window here is analogous to the white sheet of paper that we create for every new object. So the debugger is giving us a visual representation just like the physical models that we used. Um, let's keep going. So now we're on the we're about to execute the add fuel method. So let's step into that as well. And now we can see that we're back in the car class. We're in the add fuel method. Here's the code that we're about to execute. We're going to increment the instance variable fuel in tank by the value of amount. So if we hit step, we can see that fuel in tank is now changed to 10. Perfect. If we hit step again, we're back into the test drive method. And if I double click on test car, I can now see that, hey, look, cool. Um, it's now the fuel in tank is now set to 10, which is great. All right, so, every, so far everything looks like we would expect. So let's step into the drive method because clearly we're doing something wrong. So I'm going to hit step into again. And now we're inside the drive method. This is the advantage of doing one thing at a time on each line of code, is that it's going to make it easier for us to see these intermediate values as we step through it. So we've driven, the distance we're driving is 25 miles. Our fuel efficiency is 50 miles for every gallon. So as we talked about yesterday, we would expect to consume 0.5 gallons of gas. So if I hit step, I can see that the fuel can, oh wait, the fuel consumed local variable has a value of two gallons. That is not what we want. All right. Let's look at this code more carefully. There's a good chance that our bug is in this line of code right here. Okay. And so if we think about this from a, a unit's perspective, fuel efficiency is miles for every gallon. And we're dividing by distance in miles. And if we take a look at our unit and we do our dimensional analysis or we do our factor and label or whatever you call that technique in your science class, the units we'll be left with is one over gallons. That's not what we want. We want to know gallons. So I did my division wrong. I should have divided distance by the fuel efficiency. And some of you may have just noticed that, and you could just fix it and move on. And sure, if we put in a bunch of prints, we would eventually have figured that out. But it is so much more efficient just to set a breakpoint and step through the code and say, what do I expect? What is the actual value? And once those don't match, I expect half gallon fuel consumed. Oh, wait, it's two. Let me look really carefully at that line of code and fix the bug. Okay. So we fixed our bug, so we can run this again. In the debugger window, we can just hit terminate, and that kills our program. We're done. I'm going to close that window. I'm going to hit compile here to compile everything again. And we discovered a bug in BlueJay last hour. So this is a new bug I haven't seen before. The run tests button is disabled. I can't run my tests again. It appears that after we use the debugger, the run tests doesn't work. Um, so I have to like submit a bug report. But if we just quit BlueJay and relaunch it, it will open up um, the same project. And then we'll be able to run our tests again. So I'll file that bug report and then uh, Hopefully in the next version it will be fixed. So now if we run our tests, we are super happy because all four of them pass. This completes our test-driven development cycle. Okay? We <coughs> declared our methods, we defined our instance variables, we declared the constructors, but we didn't put any code in the body of the methods or constructors. We then went and wrote all of our test code. We ran the tests. They pretty much all failed like they should. Then step by step, we implemented the constructors and the methods, kept running the tests until all the tests pass. Now we can be fairly confident that we don't have any bugs in our, in our code. So 